Welcome into another off-season edition of Spits and Suds. I'm Gavin Spittle of 1053 The Fan. Thank you so much. Listen, you guys are supporting Spits and Suds. It is so cool. Our off-season programs are doing just as well as our in-season programs. And that's because of you. And it's also because there is just so much craziness happening you know, they talk about the NFL being a year round. I feel like the NHL is emulating that silly season is now year round. And we had some stars breaking news today as Jeff Merrick reported. And then others quickly followed that the Dallas stars will be buying out the contract of Ryan Suter. He had one more year left. So another year goes on, but they do have cap savings of 2.87 million Really happy to be joined by a man who joins us throughout the season. Always love his opinion. We have so much to talk about. We had the NHL awards tonight, a ton of things going on in the NHL. We're obviously going to start with stars and he's David Castillo. How are you, my friend? I am. I, you know, honestly, I've had better days, uh, but um, in terms of hockey, (laughs) in terms of hockey, I would say that, um, starting with the Dallas Stars. I think today's broadly speaking a good day. Um, and I think there, there are a lot of things we can kind of talk about when it comes to Ryan Sitter. But it, it, like part of the quote-unquote relief for me is not even necessarily about the player, but just so we don't have to have this discussion over and over again. right? Like To me, part of it is, well, I'm glad that we don't have to argue over whether or not like Ryan Sutter is, is good enough, even when he was. Um, and, and it's just, it's also for me, at least (laughs) my first thought, and, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, but my first thought is Liam Bixell, not necessarily like, oh, making room for the cap to find Chris Tanev. And, and so, yeah, it just, it it feels like something they should have done last year, but I'm like, well, they did it this year and I'm totally cool with that. It's, it's just, it seems as though the youth movement is on to, to further, continue to keep the band around, but at the same time, some cap flexibility. So chatting uh, with my man and your man, Stephen Reserve, um, I wanted to find out, because I think this is important for Stars fans, like Bixel, as far as when he was with the Texas Stars, who was his pairing? Because whether or not a lot of you like Ryan Suter, I think, and David, you may disagree. I personally like an experienced veteran with Bixel until he can kind of get his feet wet. Do I think he's NHL ready? I really do. But I certainly like a guy with some experience to be in the right positioning. If Bixel, let's say, plays that third pairing, and then you know you can go a year like that, and then Bixel might be more comfortable. So reaching out to Steven, Steven said he started the season uh, paired with Pulia, which makes more, which makes sense. David, uh, an NHL veteran and an AHL veteran. By the time he left, he was paired with Petrovic once again, a guy with NHL experience. So um, thought that was uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean it. It sort of uh, I. I guess where I sort of disagree is it's not like um, this is not a thing I'm going to die on the hill on. It's just more of a a kind of like a philosophical nitpick, um, which is the common uh, sort of observation about, well, the, you know, the best defensemen are the ones you don't notice. Gavin, can I ask you, did you notice Chris Tanev's defense in the playoffs? I, I noticed he made some really nice plays. So yes, right. The answer is yes, right. You notice the you is notice correct. stick work. Yes. You notice the speed out of the zone. Yes. The out. I noticed I mean, the like, corner work. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I'm not trying to like you know sort of you know veer you into like a force you. I just mean that like I I don't I don't personally agree with that sentiment. The idea of like oh well, great defense is invisible. I think in the modern NH, I think that was largely true maybe ten years ago, but I really see modern defense as being visibly effective, being able to facilitate the puck in all three zones regardless of how the you know the defender profiles and so to me Sutter was invisible and I think a lot of people see that as a good thing and I think he was fine but if you're looking for I always go back to the the idea that well um 
re, you know, Sutter's resume is very akin in principle to say Bixel's potential, which is that the sort of the value is um, the value is like largely abstract. And I can't help but think of Jim Neal and the organization look at it and Sutter in really like in combination with Joe Pavelski and kind of thinking, man, Pavelski hit a wall after it seemed like he was excellent. Um, why not gamble on potential over say that experience just hitting that physical decline like it did with Pavelski. And so that's part, that's really the reason why I like the move. And, it, and as far as big is concerned, I, I just, I, I think we, as much as we gas up, you know, experience, there's also a lot to be said for enthusiasm. And Big Soul's a player that he was drafted and is going to want to play in the NHL. And I don't think he's the kind of guy that's going to fold under the pressure. And the more experience he gets, the better he's going to be. And I just think in terms of what he can offer shift to shift, I mean, like if you were to scout Big Soul and Petrovic in combination, I think everybody would agree yeah, Bixel was a better player in the AHL. I thought he was a better player in the AHL. And so if I'm looking at that in terms of what you can get from shift to shift, a combination of Bixel and Petrovic on the third pair is totally fine with me. I don't necessarily think it's it's going to happen, and I would understand why, but I do think it's something they're going to try to you know develop and try to make happen if it's obvious that Bixel doesn't need to be in the AHL. And so I'm kind of like, <laughs> why not just fast forward that? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get to the point of this because it's because of cap space. If Ryan Suter was making a million dollars or 1.5, I think he'd still be with the team. Um, this was to open up 2.87 million. Now, Stars fans have to understand that the Stars are responsible um, for salary this year and also salary for 2526 as far as Ryan Suter's concerned. So I was talking with a Spitz and Suds listener the other day and if you bought out both Foxa and Suter you're talking about 3 million dollars onto the cap in 2526. So they do have a win now mentality um and we'll get to it in a little bit but I think what Stars fans also have to realize is it's not just about this year. Is it mainly about this year and TANF? Absolutely. But you have Thomas Harley up that you have to get done. You have Wyatt Johnston and Jay Gottinger getting done. And UC Sorrow signed tonight eight years with an average of 7.74 million. David Jake makes 4 million right now. So at least that price tag, if the stars want to keep them, is at least seven at this point. So to me. So I think there are future ramifications that Jim Neal has to, you can't keep everyone and everyone can't make seven or 8 million. So some interesting decisions in the future, but clearly this is all about the now and getting Tanif back here. Well, I mean, the, the Ottinger thing is interesting because uh, I realized, you know, sort of, the thing with Ottinger is that um, <laughs> the first thing I would say is like, I, well, I don't think he's as good as Saros, but um but I, I think broadly speaking, he's kind of seen in that tier possibly. Yep. But in some ways, you know, this this next year is going to be a little bit of a kind of I don't want to say prove it for Ottinger because his whole his body of work in general, I would say, is impressive. I think he's a very good goaltender, but there are still answer right. There are still things that he has to answer. I mean, he had really a terrible year uh, again, bounced back in the second half. Good for him. I think sort of bounced back in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, even though he wasn't great, but he was better. And he looked closer to the second half of the regular season than he did the first half of the regular season. But, I mean, the reason why, like, I don't necessarily kind of put Odinger, um in that sort of – I don't necessarily think about Odinger just because Odinger is going to be up for a new deal when a lot of other cap is coming off between Jamie yeah. Benn, S. Lundell. And, and by that point, you know, it'll kind of – I think it'll work itself out. I, I think that's why uh, they're pretty well positioned um, when it comes to cap because, yeah, they may like be feeling the squeeze right now, but I think they're feeling the squeeze because they want to capitalize on the momentum of two consecutive Western Conference finals, not because, oh man, you know, we're going to, 
we might screw ourselves if we, uh, you know, sign TANF to a like a, you know, five, six million dollar deal that's like three, four years. I don't think that's what he's going to get. I think people will be surprised by what TANF gets. And by that, I mean non-Stars fans. I really don't think, to me, this is just kind of the mechanics of negotiations. Um, you know, TANF's group, you know, listen to other offers, TANF himself, you know, kind of weigh in what the best decision for him and his family is. And, and Dallas also having to juggle other different things to kind of manage. So um, so cap-wise, Dallas is not in a bad spot. And so much money is going to be, I think it's what, 24, over 24, 24.7 million that's going to be coming off yeah. after this season, this upcoming season. So, um, so I don't worry too much about that. I think it's really a matter of, well, if you want to remain, if you want to, if you want to just, push your chips in. If you want to go all in, then you really, it's this year to kind of make that work. Um, I, I mean, I, I think they're Dallas is going to be broadly competitive for many years because of the age of their best players between Johnson, Stankov and Hintz, Robertson, Heiskanen. Um, so I, their window is not going anywhere. And that's what makes Dallas a really unique team. But I mean, I guess at the same time, you could also say, well, while Dallas has, a legit top pair and defender in Tanev make the most of that. And what team is this with Tanev versus without? And, you know, I, I, there are so many other discussions within that that I think can be had that, that make it quite interesting. But broadly speaking, I'm not terribly worried because um, as we'll talk about later with the draft, I mean, the, the draft is kind of what has allowed this team to, you know, really not just crack open a window, but just keep it open. I think Dallas will do whatever it takes to bring Tanif back. I think the organization in general was that impressed with him, and why wouldn't they be? Um, but I also think, David, that there are a lot of teams that are interested in Tanif. And I go back to a simple thing. This was the first time Chris Tanif had ever played in America uh, on a regular basis. So... That's a change when it comes to making sure that you have all your paperwork and then taking your family and uprooting them to a different country, um, just kind of on the fly. And the fact that his wife was treated well, his family was treated well, he was treated well, he liked his time here. Um, he made it a point to say that. I know that's just talk and you have to say that, <laughs> but at the same time, it does seem as though he wants to, if it's right, become a Dallas star for a few years to come. To me, he changed the dynamic of the defense when he arrived. If Tanif leaves, I know there are alternative options, and we can mention a couple of them. But to me, this is a piece even more than Matt Duchesne that you have to keep around. Yeah, no, I like I, I absolutely agree. I, the only thing I would say is that the one guy, and this was before news broke of how much he was probably going to get granted, but the one guy that I would say is kind of on that level, um, and also as younger as Matt Waugh. Like, he, like I, I've long yes. been a fan of his work in LA. Um, yes, and and that team has been again ignore the goals against and just look at the shot quality that's allowed per game. LA, just one of the best defensive teams. <laughs> yeah, they screwed up a lot of things with like Dubois and things and stuff like that. But um, uh, you know, Matt Wall was a big part of that. And so um he's also a player that just in terms of underlying analytics looks very similar to Tanov. Um uh, not as big, not as smooth skater, like right. a lot of the just kind of like pure skills are very different, but is a very smart defender. And so um He's supposed to be like, you know, the kind of like the Mattias Ekholm contract is kind of what they've been talking about. Yeah, he would um, be my first choice. You're right. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's definitely like a plan B. But but the thing is that that plan B is going to be probably even more expensive than Tanif. Like, I don't think Tanif gets six million. To me, I think other teams might offer that. But it's just I, I do think there are potential plan B. It sounds like Brett Pesci is headed to New Jersey and uh, even though that hasn't been finalized, but um, yeah, I mean, it, if you're, if you want to keep this top four intact and it really, it was like the, by far the best thing Dallas had to offer in the playoffs, their top four. Um, 
sure they weren't like perfect, but that's not what, I mean, that's not how you lose games. You don't lose games because the best part of your team was the best part of your team, right? There were a lot of other things that, that, uh, that became issues, but, um, I mean, it's just it's an odd year because I do think there are options that could like be comparable to Tanev, but it's just like why why give that up at this point? I mean, you know what he is; he's a known commodity. He knows the system. Bring him back. Yep, Spitz and Suds listener Howway he reached out to me earlier. Who is a realistic option if Tanev goes elsewhere? In no particular order, I definitely mentioned Matt Waugh. I also mentioned Sean Walker. Um, a couple of vets that I'm not saying are as good as Tanif or Wa or even Walker, Matt Dumba, Brendan Dillon. Oh, you mentioned Matt Dumba and people didn't attack you for that? No, no, nor should they. <laughs> there wasn't a penalty. Um, and <laughs> here we go. <laughs> and this is another name that I mentioned. And I'm not saying, but I mean, when you talk about what Tanif brings to the table defensively, Alec Martinez getting up there, you know, in his thirties, but three Stanley cups. I like the three Stanley cups and I like the shot blocking ability of Alec Martinez. So that's another name just throwing out there. Once again, not saying they're as good as Tanif, maybe minus Bois, but Sean Walker was a trade target that we talked about a lot. Matt Dumba was also a part of, uh, trade talks as far as where he was going to end up. I like the physicality of Brendan Dillon on the back line. So, I mean, just some names to throw out there. I think, I, think, I mean, <laughs> I really want to talk about Matt Dumbo all of a sudden. Like, I just, I want to lean into us, like, being the heel here and, and just trying to um, uh, enrage Stars fans. Like, no, how dare you? Um, the You know, Matt, there was a time when Matt Dumbo was a legit tough for defenseman, really unique profile, right. uh, kind of, you know, like a physical defender who yes. can, you know, add offense. But I mean, that's, I think that he kind of like with Sutter, you know, the difference being that Dumba is much younger, but just the injuries have just gotten caught up to him. And that was, I think, pretty apparent, you know, even with Tampa Bay, where I thought that was a good move. But then, you know, he just, again, just the, the injuries just are very apparent in kind of how it's affected his game. Um, but for the most part, like, I just, I don't find these other names I, to me. I think Brandon Montour is way more interesting. Than yeah. Taylor. Montour is like a good Martin, too. Martin yeah. Is. Good, good one. Um, but I honestly think also if you're, if you were trying to replace Tanif, that means you need a legit top four defenseman that can play tough minutes. And the only player that actually, the only two players that fit that profile are Wah and Pesci. It's really it. And I'm talking yeah. about genuine top four legit defense. So I think if Dallas were going to quote unquote replace Tanif without signing someone, they would have to make a hockey trade. That to me would be the move to, uh, you know, that to me would be the plan B like more than trying to like, you know, sign somebody that's going to get paid a ton. I, I think that's kind of where they can sort of also kind of, um, you know, do some gymnastics with the cap. Um, I, I think that, I mean, I don't know, like necessarily, I know that Pareko, for example, has been, kind of mentioned uh, being oh, on the trade block. That. and that's, uh, Yeah, which, uh, you know, it seems like he's kind of rebounding too. I know he had some injury issues there for a minute, um, but uh, he's a player that, yeah, he's big and physical, but he's also skilled. That would be fantastic, uh, whether it's next to Heiskanen or Harley. Yeah. Put Heiskanen back on his strong side. I know that's like a, a thing with with fans and, and sort of media. And, and you know what? Honestly, it should be a thing. I want to see Miro Heiskanen back on his strong. I I long for the – mainly because I want to see Heiskanen pass the puck again. On his strong – on his weak side, he's just – he's bombing it uh, all the time. And, like, I, I, I'm sorry, but he does not have – and that's okay. If, if Heiskanen had game-breaking, like, genuine offensive game-breaking talent, <laughs> then we'd be paying him $12 million per year. Yeah. Uh, and he doesn't, which is fine. That's part of what makes him elite defensively. He takes that responsibility seriously more than offense, which, yes, I know is critical, but um, I don't even know where I'm going with this. Well, I mean, I, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, kind listen, of there, are, there are aspects about the strong side, and one of them, which I don't know if a lot of people are aware of, the move that Connor McDavid made 
that will be replayed as far as the highlights of Connor McDavid throughout his career. When he cut to the middle, I would have liked to seen Miro on his strong side with that. Well, but I mean, you know, if whoever's on the raw, uh, whoever's on the raw right side, if it's not high skin, don't they just get dummy just as bad? I mean, maybe. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, like, I, I agree. But I think to me, when I think about what affects high skin the most playing on his weak side, it's the offense. And yes. Even though I feel like there's a cap on Heisken's offense, just in general, because I don't think he's the offensive talent that Kale McCarr or like an Adam Fox are, still somebody that um, I think still has untapped potential, but it's just, it's hard for him to develop that if he's just not in a position to do so. And yeah. being on the weak side leaves him, doesn't leave him in a position to do so. That's why I've heard people kind of mention, especially with all the trades that they've done and the business they've done already. Uh, someone like Rasmus Anderson, who I think would be fantastic. You know, this would just this would allow Heisken to do what he does does best, which is play defense, shut other players down. Anderson, I, I think, is completely like competent defensively, but adds that you know, like like a Klingberg with more like bite, with more like physicality and and uh, you know bite in in some respects. Um, that's a guy that I, I would love to see a hockey trade involved with. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, listen, I mean, if we want to get into trades, Adam Larson has a year left on his contract. What are you going to give for Seattle to get that? You know, I mean, I don't think Seattle wants to get rid of him, but that would be a nice pairing with Haskinen as well. The one thing I will say, because you talked about top four, Sean Walker did have career high minutes as far as the Philadelphia Flyers with 1935. So when he went to Colorado, that went down. He switched to the third pairing at 1756. I actually thought he had a good series against Dallas. So um, really interesting. I mean, it's it's fascinating because um, I put out the tweet today that, you know, it was surprising slash shocking. And that people said, really, Gavin, you're shocked by this. I actually was David, because I thought that Suter, you know, was a guy that the organization liked. Um, and I think I thought they wanted to play it out, but, and it leads to my next topic is that I like the way the stars are handling this off season with honest and candid conversations and realizing that the window is now, you're right, the future is bright, but as far as everyone coming back, tough moves need to be made, and that leads us to another topic of conversation that I found very fascinating, and it's not a lot of money, but when we look at Scott Wedgwood, uh, who was uh, interviewed, um, and I thought it was really, really interesting what he said, and this is courtesy of Sam Nessler. Um, and leaving Dallas would be heartbreaking, pending UFA goalie Scott Wedgwood. And he said, we've had our talks and it hasn't been in my favor. But we have a few days left to see where there's some work to be done. And he talks about the relationship with Ottinger that he wants to help Jake. And I think that's great and wonderful. And when you look at the salary, it's not that much, but I do think Wedgwood needs a raise and, you know, maybe the stars, every single dollar counts, but here's what I also like, David. Wedgwood goes on to say, obviously the more term you have, the more comfortable you are, but it's a great team snug against the cap. They've got things to figure out. Paying Matt Duchesne half of probably what he's worth. Chris Tanev, one-third of what he's worth. You've got Thomas Harley coming up. Some pieces to be figured out. So he says, I think I've proved a vital, I'm a vital piece, not only just on the ice, but my chemistry with Ottinger. They've kind of set a price for it, and we're looking for a little bit more. But to me, I think when you're mentioning Matt Duchesne, Chris Tanev, Thomas Harley, to me, that stars camp telling Wedgwood's camp, here's the situation we're in. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 nice. I think it for you know, for as much as I normally find um a lot of this, yeah, I love being here, kind of boiler, boilerplate, kind of borderline. Um, it, you know, that that is like confirmed by you know, most one of the reasons why Jim Neal tends to attract the big fish is because of that culture. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't think Wedgwood is gassing up the stars organization 
uh, saying stuff like that. I, I think it's genuine, and I think it reflects the reality of the way Jim Neal runs the Dallas Stars. I mean, this is <laughs> – which I always find slightly at odds with the um, – uh, horse crap saga, but you know, that wasn't him that said it. Right. So we can just kind of ignore that. Um, but also like, I just, I don't know that to me, I mean, there's a reason why backup goaltenders, like if I'm, if I can swing something that is not going to break the, which it will break the bank, but like you look at somebody like Lauren Brassois, I mean, that, that to me is like, that's a more interesting name. Um, even Cam Talbot. Um, I, I don't, like it's, I, I like Scott Wedgwood, and I think one of the hardest positions in hockey is being the backup, um, because you are held to the same standard as the starting goaltender when you play, even though that's not who you are. Um, and so it's really almost kind of like a performance art. And so in that context, I think Wedgwood was solid. But again, we're talking about a backup goaltender. And so that's where I kind of feel like, well, you know, if you can find an upgrade, not that I think there's a ton out there, but <clears throat> excuse me, if you can find an upgrade, I think ultimately that's more interesting. Ideally, you would want to maybe even potentially challenge and shake Andre a little bit when he has runs like he had with the first half of the season. But I know it's not realistic. And again, Andre, like the Dallas Stars have full faith in him and he's going to be the number one goaltender for as long as he's here. But um but I don't know. This would be like an interesting season to do that, right? Because, well, this will be the last year on his deal. And <laughs> if you wanted to find out what a post Ottinger world would look like, yep. somebody that would push him would potentially be it. <laughs> well, the question becomes, because you follow the AHL, what about Matt Murray? <laughs> no. I mean, the, I, the you know, the the – Texas Stars goaltenders were really interesting because I thought there were times when they looked fantastic, not just uh, Matt Murray, but also Remy Poirier. Um, and uh, who's the one they, they brought in at the last minute, uh, the college goaltender? I don't know what, Ben Cross, right? I think that was his name. Um, yeah. And uh, and they all had moments where they looked fantastic. And then they had moments where you're just like, what happened here, man? Okay, okay all right. They're, they're not going to be pushing for a job anytime soon. But um, I, so I don't think that's it, but also we're also talking about the backup position. And so, no, I, I, I get it. I, I think, I think a point that I'm should have slipped in is that I think w this franchise needs a up and coming goalie in their system. Oh, okay. The, I mean, they the German goaltender did pretty well this season, didn't they? Arno yes. Uh, yeah, I think there's just a question of whether he's coming over here or not. Is there really like I, I have not been following? Yeah, but, I mean, I, th I think there. I mean, I think he will, but yeah, yeah, come over here, play in North America. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like I man, I always goaltenders. I because I can just never understand them. I can never really unpack kind of what makes the most sense. Yeah, um, but I, I think Ottinger is definitely not as kind of volatile as it, you know. As I've said before. I, you look at the best goaltenders in the NHL. Uh, even Shesterkin had like a really difficult, um, like a, a much more erratic regular season than he usually has. And that's just because of the nature of the position, like it's just subject to even the best goaltenders are going to have those down. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, two examples, David, Sergei Bobrovsky for years was talked about as the worst contract in the NHL. And I don't think as he lifts the cup, people are talking about his $10 million salary anymore. Um, I think the other one is tonight's Vesna trophy winner, Connor Hellebuck. I want to say it's 2019. I'll have to look it up. Did not have a good season and rebounded. And I can't think that's kind of what gets me excited about potential with uh, Jake Ottinger coming up because you know, it's one of those things. If Jake can rebound like Hellebuck rebounded, um, you know, it's that that's that's being a goalie, and that's what uh, that's what happens. Yeah, 2018, 2019, David, uh, 2.90 goals against, 913 save percentage, 63 games. Yeah, and that's that's another thing that I feel like a lot of kind of stars fans uh, understate whenever they kind of think about like, well, man, like. 
how, how are we going to get it? How are we going to improve on, you know, this, this past season, if, if the TANF situation is still up in the air and, um, and we're not sure about Duchesne and we got to replace Pavelski's points and so forth, which is that Dallas had to win a lot of games, basically outscoring the opposition um, because of just broadly speaking, you know, the, you know, uh, season that Odinger had. And so it's important to kind of keep that in mind as well when thinking about Dallas prospects, which is that Odinger does not have to, you know, Odinger has to just be better. And chances are this is going to look like a very similar team, even if they don't have Duchesne or Pavelski back. Now, granted, they'll probably, you know, bring somebody in, but nonetheless, I think the point still stands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that article uh, about Wedgwood is from Sam Nessler of Daily Faceoff. I tweeted it out uh, at GJ Spittle if you want to uh, uh, read that. So I had a thought, and it's too early, but wanted to run these lines by you, David, before we get into some NHL news. We had the award ceremony tonight, and we'll talk about some other stuff. Um, but here are my lines as we move to the forwards. Bear with me. First line, Hints, Robertson, Johnston. Second line, I run back Sagan, Duchesne, Mason Marchman. Third line, I go Ben, Bork, Stankoven because of Bork's familiarity with Stankoven. And I think that's a pretty good line. And then fourth line, I bring back Sam Steele. He's a restricted free agent. Radic Foxa comes back for his final year, and then it's place other forward here, dot, dot, dot. Uh, William Carrier, right, probably. But it, it, like, even if it's not, um, that's that's exactly what I have. I I'll would take have that. Carrier, by the way. I will take Carrier. Yes. Yes, uh, please. I, I would definitely be playing the Ben Bork Stankoven line more minutes than the uh, Duchesne Marchment uh, Sagan line, but of course that's just nitpicking, um, and, and and they're not going to give Bork those type of minutes. But yeah, I, I think that's one of the reasons why I feel like as long as they bring Tanif back, like everything else will kind of more or less fall into place. Um, yeah. Again, you know, there's that there's that sort of uh, cheap point about like, well, how do you replace 132 points? But I mean, if you're bringing Duchesne back and you're essentially replacing Pavelski with Maverick Bork, like I, I really, I don't, especially when you consider what the, what playing Johnson on the top line is going to do for his production and also a full season of Stan Coben. Um, So I, I think those lines are fantastic. I, I think that is pretty much uh, exactly what last season's roster was, but a little bit younger. And some younger legs, and um, like a you know just much better long term potential. Yeah, uh, absolutely. A interesting um, tweet today from uh, David K, and he says, um, "I did listen to your podcast. A couple of my buddies, because I mentioned him, that I shared your podcast commented too. Um, he says, thanks to you. Listen, I'm listening to 105.3 The Fan. Nice." And I'm a subscriber to D Magazine, thanks to David Castillo. Stick tap to you for the great content. Really appreciate your perspectives and focus on the stars. But he does ask, as far as free agents, really curious if players and agents value the lesser taxes in Texas. I just wanted to hit that uh, real quick as free agency is approaching because this came up when a couple of years ago we were talking about John Tavares and all, you know, when it came out that Dallas was a finalist and the, the state taxes were being added and why Dallas, you know, it's not this amount. It's actually this amount that I'll be making because there's no state income tax. Obviously Tavares ended up signing in Toronto, but I wanted to get your perspective, David, maybe with a lesser contract, but I think people have to realize when it gets up there in the millions, I don't think it's a determining factor. Is it a nice aspect? Sure. But I don't think a player is saying, you know what? 
I'm coming to Dallas because of this. I think they're coming to Dallas because of the opportunity to win now. They see the youth. They see the veteran experience. And Jim Nill and his reputation as far as the organization is really good right now. Yeah, no, like, like I agree. I, I think there are definitely things that, um, you know, and this is something that Elliot Friedman has kind of talked about, something that that general managers might want to eventually kind of discuss um, with sort of like, you know, kind of how taxes work. Yeah, honestly, like I, I think we need to bring on like a sort of a kind of global tax ec- expert, however, to kind of really unpack. I remember like a, many years ago, Brian Burke kind of talking about this. Uh, sort of like organization or this uh, fund that um, players can use to offset those tax irregularities between playing across, you know, Canada versus U.S. teams. So like it, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff to kind of discuss. So that's obviously well beyond, you know, kind of my expertise. But the thing that I think, you know, gets sometimes kind of lost is that just like you said, like these, I mean, players, yes, the money absolutely matters. But for if if it was nothing about the money, if it was just about the money, then Pavelski uh, doesn't take that sweetheart deal, you know, the previous couple of seasons. Um, Duchesne, you know, doesn't take a $3 million deal when he could have received more. I mean, the players are not just looking for, you know, they're, it's, it's money as much as it, is, as it is stability, opportunity to win, good teammates, good culture. And, um, you know, and, and we can all relate to that, right? Who doesn't want a job where, man, I just, I can, you know, be surrounded by better people. That's a fantastic job. You know, <laughs> I can, yeah. I'll take a pay cut for that. But um, so, so yeah, like I, I don't, it's, it's definitely an issue that may kind of come to a head, but if for the players themselves, um, I, you know, I think it's, it can factor when all the other things aren't accounted for, but that's, yeah. That's why you run an organization like Dallas and you make sure you treat people the right way and right. Uh, all that other stuff. Uh, a couple of defensemen off the board, David signing before free agency period, Dylan DeMello signs a multi-year contract uh, with staying with the Winnipeg jets. I think it was good value for the jets and, and good on DeMello. I like his game a lot. Um, Tyler Myers agrees to a three-year contract with the Canucks, three years, nine million. So he gets three million dollars a year. Tyler Myers grew up in Houston, and then when they found out he could play hockey, his family moved to Canada. So, <laughs> man, Tyler Myers is such like he's like if I could the player that I understand the least is Tyler Myers. Yeah, who so talented, so massive. And yet just doesn't seem to like put it all together at times. He's a player that like I like in concept I should I should love, but um uh man, you're so plugged into hockey, I don't understand why you even have me on the show. Like can you, can you <laughs> run this yourself? And <laughs> well, it's because of you spits and suds listeners, I can't take a vacation. <laughs> And you know what? I'm absolutely loving it. Thank you, David. It's very nice of you to say. Okay. NHL awards tonight. Avalanche center. Nathan McKinnon wins the Hart trophy as the NHL MVP also takes home. I know Ted Lindsay honor. Any issues with that? Uh, McDavid uh, in the running as well as Austin Matthews in the running. No, no. I mean, like I'm just kind of messing around. I think McKinnon just, Put, obviously put together a career year and uh and it was like well deserved you know the one of the things that i know stars fans are going to hate this but one of the things that like i really kind of felt bad about for mckinnon is that for whatever reason colorado just like they really seem to ignore how important cadre was and yes yeah they you know stuck middle stat in there but it's just like a totally different player yep. different dimension and I don't understand what it, it's so weird that they won a cup and then they just kind of started spinning their wheels over the last couple of years instead of building on some like a team that I felt could have been a lot better. Um, and I realized Kadri, you know, kind of priced himself out in some ways because he was so good. But um, Kadri was absolutely that kind of player that you just I mean, I realized Toronto fumbled the bag there and, and sure, like Kadri got himself suspended. But I mean, I, I think he's a really. He's just like the, I mean, as much as I think it's kind of cheesy to kind of talk about like, you know, physicality and, and, and hey, yada, hey, yada. Hey. I, I, listen, I love it. I'm just saying like, I, I don't, as a factor into what wins games, but Kadri is just, 
he's a playoff performer and like i yes. i think he's fantastic i think i agree kind of a big reason why colorado went downhill but yes well deserved for nathan McKinney. he's a pest in a good way yes yeah something actually candidly i think the stars need i mean <laughs> I, I talked to sean last week david and I know he got scratched a lot, but the one thing I really did like about Ty DeLandria is he did good or bad. Sometimes it led to penalties. <laughs> I thought he brought energy onto the ice and for a team that can't figure out how to get going. Um, I would like them to see, you know, I don't think they have like a, an energy guy. Whereas if something is, you know, if they're stagnant, they can cause a scrum. They can get in front of the goalie and, and get the crowd riled up. They can make a big play, you know, things like that. So, no, I actually agree. I, I did not like that, uh, that trade at all. Like, I, I don't, <laughs> your, I mean, I realized like the, the main thing is like, oh, hey, your first round pick, you turned into a fourth rounder. That's like, that's to me, it wasn't necessarily that. It was just like, well, you had a cost controlled player that you could plug up and down the lineup who, yeah. Had, who you didn't give a whole lot of experience to and added an element of hockey that Dallas largely lacks. Now, I, I think I think the reason why it works for Florida, though, is because, well, a lot of their best players add that. Um, Barkov, to me, yeah, he's not a jerk, but he's very physical in the corners. Um, freaking Dmitry Filipovich had a great clip of just nothing but awesome, like Barkov <laughs> highlights that were nothing but him you know, bullying people in the corners with stick work and positioning. And then you have like, you know, Matthew Kachuk, Sam Bennett. These are some of their best players yeah. that, that are able to play that way. Whereas Dallas, it just, you're not going to get that out of Johnston and Hintz and Heiskanen. Maybe you should. Um, there was a, there was a point in time where Heiskanen was throwing reverse hits and I'm kind of like, where did that guy go? But, but yeah, I mean, I'm bouncing across like 10 different topics. No, I agree with I, you. I do though. miss Delandria. Like I yeah. do think I would have, <laughs> I would have attached a high-end asset. And I'm not going to say which one because I don't want to be flogged, but I would have attached a high-end asset to prioritize getting rid of FAXA first if that was the decision. If it was a decision between a high-end yeah. asset and FAXA, but you get to keep Delandria, I would have absolutely done that. Right. But again, that's just armchair GM. Yeah, yeah. I think FAXA has shown at times, specifically in the playoffs, that he can provide a lot of physicality, but he just doesn't you know, it's just not there as much during the uh, season. Okay, further awards. Con Connor Bedard wins the Calder as Rookie of the Year. Yeah, I mean, that that's just kind of a formality, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Hellebuck from Winnipeg wins the Vesna Trophy as the top goalie. I think this is deserved. Um, big, big, big fan of Connor Hellebuck. Um, interesting to see. I know we're down the line, but... USA has them some pretty darn good goalies. It's the only thing, like, same thing, formality for Hellebuck. The only thing that's unfortunate is that I feel like that Winnipeg is kind of, they did the same thing just at a higher level that Dallas did when they weren't good, but Kerry Lenton was good. And it kept them in this weird hyperspace of, like, being sort of competitive, but not really. The difference being that Winnipeg actually made the playoffs, having an elite goaltender. And I they should have... You have a goaltender that good. It better be attached to a great team. And the rest of the team is not that good. Absolutely should have like traded him at some point just to get like, you know, a ton of value starting you. I mean, this is an organization that's that's going to be rebuilding, I think, pretty soon. Like you don't Shifley to me is not a number one center. And their best players, they've just largely kind of sidelined, you know, like Ellers, <laughs> for example. I mean, there's no reason why he should be on the chopping block while Kyle, Kyle Connor is like somehow a mainstay but that's neither here nor there no but you bring something up um there was big news and we talked about it on uh spits and suds and uh, i don't know if you got to listen to that podcast uh david um but you know he was terrific we had connor rabcheck on from winnipeg sports talk and yes, I listened to it by the way i just i want to point out i listened to that episode i am listening to spits thank and you Sud. <laughs> no, that's uh that's that's super nice of you. Um and Connor's really really good and I really enjoy his podcast. But one of the reasons that I wanted to have him on is and I'm going to ask you because you're really good at 
you know, scouting draft picks. And I love your opinion on this, but their first round pick Rutger McGordy from the university of Michigan is quote unquote on the trading block. And a lot of teams love him. Do you think he gets dealt this draft weekend? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Dallas isn't going to be the one to uh, get him because I'm sure somebody else is going to offer Winnipeg just, you know, they're going to have assets to offer them. Uh, but yeah, I, I would I would imagine so. I mean, like it's because the writing is on the wall. Right. I mean, and and for Winnipeg, it's just better to kind of get ahead of I mean, you're you are essentially selling high here. Yeah, there's the story, you know, and there's the, you know, like, well, he's probably not going to play, but that's not like, this is not like a player that is um, refusing to play or somebody that's wait going to, you know, see the end of their, I mean, I just, I think Winnipeg is going to be, because of this draft, um, they're going to be well positioned to make a good deal. And so that's why I think, you know, kind of like in the same way that, you know, Anaheim and Philadelphia made the most of the Cutter Gauthier situation. I, th I think you'll see something like that with Winnipeg. And I think usually, right, the whole like NHL is a copycat league. Winnipeg sees that, hey, it can be done. Um, and you're talking about, uh, you know, a, a left wing power forward. Um, that's absolutely going to be a premium, something that Dallas should consider. <laughs> you know, I'm just, just saying, <laughs> but, um, cause, cause I really do like him as a prospect. I, I do too. Uh, you know, it's so fascinating. I think, you know, this David, but I don't know if Spitz and Suds listeners, you rightfully so mentioned Cutter Gauthier and the news that that drew as he went to Anaheim from Philadelphia, Rutger McGordy is really close with Cutter Gauthier. They grew up together. Um, so it's fascinating because you know both of them were talking about this. Yeah, I mean it's so what so do you think that uh that Anaheim is a team that's in on them? Boy, if they are, um that would be an impressive team. The, but, it's but the but the question is, David. Anaheim has their own player that quote unquote might be on the trading block. Correct. Well, I, I think, but see, I think they're done with that. Like, I mean, it's just what room is there for Trevor Zegris who fantastic right. talent. Um, fantastic. But if, if you're already like you have, it's kind of one of the reasons why, like I get after you for mentioning the physicality, which is that I just don't feel like Dallas, it's not a predominant element in their game. I love it. I would like to see more of it, but their best players don't represent that. Anaheim, however, you know, when you're talking about Mason McTavish, I realize Leo Carlson is not like necessarily a power forward, but he's a big dude and he like plays well positionally like that, that, you know, kind of like almost a la Barkov. Right. Um, and, um, and then you add Carter Gauthier and McGrory, like you are, <laughs> that, that is going to be just a, uh, just a mammoth team kind of similar to Vegas. It almost sounds like that's maybe what Pat Verbeek is, potentially trying to do. I realize they haven't traded for McGordy, but right. um, that I think when you, when you have a team that's already kind of built in a way where you can bring in talent that accentuates that, that's when it matters. Yeah. Um, but um, oh, God, again, you know, see, you got me off track. Off no, oh, no, this is good. This is <laughs> NHL talk. And this is what Spitz and Suds listeners like, because my goal of this podcast is obviously talk a lot of stars, but at the same time, I think if we could educate people around the league and people say, Oh, I didn't know that. And they, you know, one of the things that I love most is when I see reviews about spits and suds, they say, love the experts that Gavin has on and you, my friend are an expert. Um, <laughs> That's nonsense. <laughs> I appreciate you gassing me up, but I know, did gas you up just there. I love it. <laughs> but I, you know, but hockey fans should be interested in the draft because if you want a bird's eye view into the evolution of hockey itself, the draft is where you start. Because I mean, those are going to be the future players, right? You know, um, in five, ten years, you know, the the players that you know predominate, you know, this draft, previous, and the one before that, um, that's going to be the opposition. Some of those players are also going to be on the Dallas Stars, ideally. And so, um, yeah, it's it's one of the reasons why the draft is, for me, my favorite part of, uh, of following hockey in general. And um, and yeah, I just I, I think it's it's really it's it's 
not only is it just kind of fun to sort of follow, but it's also kind of fun to look at in retrospect. I mean, how many of us love to kind of look at and then sort of make fun of teams that passed up on Logan Stanko and her Wyatt Johnson? Granted, we have our own wounds from 2014 and 2016 and so forth, but uh, that's the, I think that's part of the joy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Quinn Hughes wins the Norris. It was really fun to watch him in Vancouver this year. Yeah, um, he was he was my favorite player in that draft over Bouchard and Dobson, who have turned into fantastic defensemen. But I, I think Quinn Hughes that was well deserved. Um, he's a player that again I think is kind of sometimes misunderstood. You know, he's kind of the rare puck mover who does not um, abdicate his defensive responsibilities. Yeah, he's limited in like how he can play defense because of his size but still plays extremely well. And, you know, we, we saw this with like Tanev, like Tanev was like good in the defensive zone because he can skate and puck handle and pass, not because he's just, you know, uh, elbowing guys off of him, like some sort of behemoth. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I did want to mention Ken Holland, not returning as Oilers general manager, a great way to go out. And <laughs> was it I mean, with the Jack Campbell? Well, well I mean, you know what I'm saying. I mean, <laughs> I'm just messing. Yeah, that's point. no, that's a good point. They they did not win the cup, but it was a heck of a run. Um, but I did want to give a stick tap. I mean, heck of a run. I mean, um, you know, is there a Jim Nil without a Ken Holland? I guess is my. That's point. a fair point. Yeah, unbelievable run in Detroit. I mean, building that, just the Euro influence, and just the players. Um, that they had and those Detroit teams were just beasts and they just gave Dallas nightmares for a number of years. And then, you know, he goes to Edmonton and say what you want, but that Edmonton team was in a little bit of a rough shape and, uh, you know, made some good moves and now he's not returning. But I mean, <laughs> you know, I think I would just I would just just wanted to quickly say like it, there was a low bar set by Peter Chiarelli. <laughs> I agree. I agree. But yes, I, I for all the guff that he's given for the Darnell Nurse contract and and the Jack Campbell also made some really just like solid shrewd moves with like Zach Hyman and like Mattias Ekholm like those are just like home runs. Right. Yeah. No. A a absolutely. Another trade, Andrew Mangiapani traded to the Washington Capitals from the Calgary Flames for a second round pick. I just want to say, first, I like Mangiapani's game. Second, it's very tough just to say Mangiapani without saying Mangiapani. <laughs> I don't know why you felt it appropriate to include that joke, but I will say <laughs> that um, that is like just a bizarre bit of business for Calgary. I, I think it's a really good deal. I think it's interesting that Washington is like, Yes, we know Ovechkin is like 60 years old, but we're right. going to try to like win for him. Like we yes. want him. That's I applaud them for it. Yeah, I mean they're 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 going to be interesting. Haven't got your thoughts yet, but just recently, Linus Olmark, when we talk about modified no trade lists, I love seeing when the lists come out. Uh, Linus Allmark asked, did you waive your modified no trade to go to Ottawa? And he said, Ottawa was not on my list. Absolutely love that. David, this is when Gavin Spittle throws out these crazy things, just like his physical physicality tirade that he always goes on. Now, <laughs> understand, my friends, this is a division with the Stanley Cup champion Panthers, Boston Bruins, Toronto Maple Leafs, Tampa Bay Lightning, and the Detroit Red Wings, oh yeah, Buffalo's not bad. Montreal's rebuilding. I actually kind of like the Senators. Man, they're, you know, it's, it's. I actually agree. By the way, I'm really curious what it is they do to entice. They attract for for a team yes. that like you know, nobody thinks about Ottawa as like this destination, right? right? But they get a lot of you know, like Tarasenko. Uh, to bring cat. I mean, they're, they're really able to kind of, I don't know how they do it, but anyways, like I, I think they're a team that for um, again, like I like to look at the underlying numbers. I like to look at spreadsheets instead of hockey. I'm just wired that way, Gavin, Love it. <laughs> but um, they're, they're a team that it really like when you look at the underlying, when you pop open the hood, um, 
this is a team that really like has deserved a better faith than they've got recently. Now, does that mean like, well, um, stats don't tell you everything? Sure. Like, but I also think, you know, we see this all the time where, you know, sometimes it just takes some bad goaltending to make a, a team look worse than they actually are. Um, in the same way, like great goaltending can make a coach look brilliant. And, um, and Ottawa is a team that I absolutely do like, mainly because I, I think the Fords are there, the bulk of their defense is there. Um, it's still like a defense. I mean, Chikrin, like Shabbat, I mean, like Sanderson, these are, these are fantastic defensemen. I, they, it's so weird that they don't really have a weak spot, but the one weak spot they've had, they've just never been able to fix until now. Uh, I think it still re- kind of remains to be seen, though, what Old Mark is going to look behind an Ottawa team that's never been great in terms of team defense versus Boston, which has always been just an absolute beast team, like in terms of team, team defense. Yes. This weekend, everyone, keep an eye on Utah Hockey Club, formerly the Arizona Coyotes. Why, Gavin? One first round pick, three second round picks, three third round picks, two fourth round picks. And they have four picks after that in rounds five, six, and seven. They have $40 million in cap space, lots of holes to fill. So watch out for Utah as far as possible trade partners and trying to, uh, because here's what I talked about on the podcast earlier this week. And Seattle and Vegas took advantage of teams looking to dump salaries. Utah is not an expansion club, but I think that the new owner and to impress Salt Lake City, obviously it's going to be a rapid fan base, rabid fan base, not rapid. That would mean they're quick, (laughs) (laughs) but I think they want to make a splash. I don't think this is, the Arizona Coyotes part two. So I'm really, really interested to see what Utah does this weekend with all this draft capital. No, I like, I agree. I think also because you look at Arizona this season and they had a really fantastic first half. Uh, Well, not first half, but really a fantastic, like first couple months where they were actually in a playoff spot. And it really seemed like they were kind of building on something. It seemed like maybe they were sort of like the Buffalo of the West. And um, and then sort of things just kind of cratered. And I don't necessarily think it was – I think it was definitely kind of a team kind of playing uh, overperforming. But I also don't think that they were as bad as they seemed when they just like hit that massive losing streak, what, like during December, January, whatever it was. And so I actually would expect to see – like I, I think that would make sense because you have – a lot of players there in the prime of their careers between Keller and Schmaltz. And I just think if you're going to, if you're going to do something and you have this much cap, well, I mean, you know, we saw with Vegas, like it can happen overnight if you want it to. Um, And they're, you know, they they don't have to be uh, sort of the, uh, (laughs) the, the laundry operation that say like Arizona was. Um, And uh, it, it just, they they are well positioned if they want to. Yeah, there's still a lot of work. You know, you absolutely want to kind of improve the blue line, but um, their offense is fine, man. Their offense is solid, and they can improve it, and they've got the money to do so. And right. I I would not. Yeah, I agree with you. I would not be surprised at all. Yes, let's make a trade for Michael Kesselring, please, or maybe Sean Dersey. Just saying, <laughs> I like those guys, uh, but I think they they want to build because those two guys are young. All right. Um, finally, David, you do an outstanding job highlighting players in this year's draft. And you talked about if player falls to the Dallas stars, give the spits and suds listeners your ultimate, uh, as far as who would you like to see drafted by the stars if they are available when they pick. So, you know, one of the things that, that sort of people will inevitably talk about is like, oh, man, who, who's the best player available? Like, um, and, and what do we need? Like, I, I'm going to ignore that whole thing. Because if you can tell me the difference between EJ Emery and, say, Charlie Ellick, or if we're talking about forwards, uh, the difference between, like, um, say, I don't know, um, Jet Luchenko and Merrick Van Acker, then, then I'll listen to you. 
if you can't, then let's just ignore this. So there are a lot of fantastic players. The thing that I love about this draft is that a lot of the players that are going to be picked lower have very, very high floors. Whereas higher in the draft, you have quite a few like boom bust types. Um, thinking about Cole Iserman, thinking about Zane Perrick, even though I think he's fantastic, uh, just a brilliant offensive player. But for Dallas, EJ Emery is my number one pick. And it's not because he's a right shot defenser. Yeah, <laughs> I thought you were going to say that. Yeah, it's because he's a fantastic three zone defender. Um, he adds size, six foot three. Yes, he had 16 points in 61 games. So you know exactly what you're getting. But even though like the offense is, isn't there, to me, like he's good offensively where he needs to be good offensively, which is in the defensive zone in the same way Tanif is. Can make a great outlet pass, has very, very smooth skater. Um, and he's just a guy that, I mean, if it sounds cheesy and as much as I hate comparables, but if you're looking to replace Tanif, in the next two or three years, EJ Emery is absolutely that guy. And I think he's the one that represents the best in terms of right shot defenders that can play that sturdy defensive, that kind of hybrid defensive game. And I think there are cut, there's another uh, couple defenders that also do that between Charlie Ellick. Uh, he had 27 points in 65 games. Um, also, uh, he's a faster skater than Emery, but same profile. Again, hybrid shutdown defender. Um, just looks fantastic. Uh, also adds like an edge. He's a little bit meaner as well. Um, Dominic Badinka, who played professionally, um, is another player that I think looks fantastic. Has a little bit more of an offensive upside than those other two. Um, the defense is, you know, maybe a little bit more questionable, but it's not that bad. He, you know, he, this is a guy that was trusted to play 14, 15 minutes a game by, you know, in a professional league by his head coach. Like that has not happened often. Um, I know a lot of people like Adam Yurchek. Um, I do too. I just feel like if I'm thinking about, if I'm just using that, if I have the tunnel vision of like, hey, who's going to replace Chris Tanev? Um, Yurchek is definitely not that guy. But if we, if Dallas needs offense, like <laughs> Yurchek projects to add that. Um, not as good as his brother David Yurchek, but still fantastic. Uh, ben Danford is another guy. Sturdy defensive defenseman shoots right, not as big as the others, but probably more physical. And um, again, just a really solid. Uh, I'm trying to think about like a good comparable for Ben Danford. I guess maybe like a um, uh, like a Ryan McDonough, perhaps. Oh, wow. um, yeah, like it really. I mean, he was he was. I think like at some point supposed to be like the captain of the team, and we were talking about like an 18 year old player. Um, so um, love him. Jet Luchenko is kind of like a. Stankoven starter kit, uh, 74 points in 68 games this season. Um, he also <laughs> rated number one in uh, right-hand grip strength and number one in left-hand grip strength at the Combine, which I think is kind of fascinating. I don't know like how much that really matters because remember Sam Bennett was a guy that couldn't do pull-ups and people criticized him for that. Right. And now he's like the most vicious like forward in the game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, if you were looking for a power forward, Emil Hemming, um, is is a fantastic smooth skating player that would add size. Uh, play he's right wing, and I think most people are kind of looking for a left wing if that's kind of Dallas's, um, you know, if that's where they're going with that. But so many good players. Like I, I think there are a ton of fantastic players you can list that are going to fall the 29th, and that's why I'm I'm super excited for it. That's great. Uh, I'm excited for this weekend as well for the trades for the stars picks. Um, and excited to follow up with you um, on what you thought of the Stars drafts and uh, the crazy weekend that it will be. Silly season in full effect. I will say this to Stars fans. The emergence of Wyatt Johnston, the emergence of Logan Stankoven, Maverick Bork, Liam Bixel. Am I correct, David? This normally does not happen this fast. The Stars have had a great run as far as draft picks making somewhat of an immediate impact. And usually there's a few years. No, I think that says a lot about the, the draft in itself and not just the, you know, not just the scouts job and kind of how just like awesome they were in drafting these players to begin with, but also really the evolution of um, sort of just hockey at the lower levels itself, where, 
players are just better prepared, um, better diets. They have, you know, they have coaches um, that sort of that are there to specifically develop them. And um, and I think they're kind of even though development is not necessarily where it should be, um, I think for the most part, a lot of these kind of lower leagues have done a better job in in making these players better. Like I look at, you know, I look at a lot of, for example, a lot of the Fords that Dallas could potentially like Merrick Vanacker is another player that I haven't mentioned uh, who's left wing. Um, he's got, he's a plus athlete. Um, <clears throat> and the thing that he has in common with some of the other players, some of the other Fords that I could see falling down to Dallas, like Teddy Stiga, who's like faster Maverick Bork. I don't think he's going to be where uh, Dallas is picking, but if you look at the profiles, of a lot of these players, they're also responsible. Like, so a lot of these players are coming in with, added dimensions that you would not have expected from most prospects five or 10 years ago. And, and that I think is one of the reasons why you're seeing players like Johnston, Stanko and Bork ready or, you know, ready ahead of schedule because they're just, they're, they're players that coaches don't have to worry about anymore. And I realize like Tortorella has his own opinions about like, ah, oh, players are young and dumb. Like I just, I disagree with that entirely. Uh, but, um, but I, I think that's part of it. That's just, part of how lower level hockey is played now where it's just the quality is better. And now you're seeing it affect the NHL. And so when these players transition, they're just much better prepared and they're much better prepared naturally. That is the great David Castillo. Listen, Spitz and Suds fans. I absolutely love you. We got to get David some more Twitter followers because what he's ripping off is gold tonight. Um, or better yet, follow his <laughs> Substack because he won't promote it, but I will. So go to Substack, which is s u b s t a c k dot com. You know, I mentioned it with Sean as well. And David's is called Star Stack, and all that information can be at, at David Castillo AC. I mean, the guy is such a good dude. He donated to a pig shelter. I mean, it's right <laughs> on you, the phone. Oh man, you saw that. <laughs> I did, and I absolutely love. Is that the Central Texas Pig Shelter? No, I'm glad you. But by, by the way, for for those listening that like might be sort of like, oh God, he's one of those. I'm actually not vegetarian. I, I try to be more careful about what I eat, but I do for whatever reason, man. I just I love pigs. I would love to have my own pig farm if I could afford it. Uh, but yes, yeah, I, I gave some money. They they <laughs> they made. Uh, it was actually my parents' gift to me on Christmas, and. It was, hey, we want like some way to like, I, I don't know, just uh, something to like, you know, reward whatever, you know, me like donating and sponsoring like various pigs at their their shelter. Um, and uh, that was what they did. They make this, they made that big, um, what, what do you call it? Like, I don't even know what the, for some uh, yeah. yeah. So basically it's a pig shelter and it says donated by the Castillo family. And the name of the shelter is called David Castillo <laughs> pig shelter. And I think it's fascinating. I uh, love it. Absolutely love it. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's terrific. I, my, my name gets to live on, which is to me like a much better dream than like having a son or daughter. Like the fact that I don't have, you know, not having kids, greatest decision I ever made. <laughs> Just kidding. The, uh, but uh, yeah, man, like that's, uh, I'm, uh, that was really my parents' gift. Uh, but, you know, part of that is because, yeah, I just, I, you know, kind of like given to sanctuary, animal sanctuaries in general, right? I mean, ASPCA, stuff like that. I'm, uh, uh, no matter how much I talk about my love of the UFC and boxing, I am just a softie at heart. Yes, you are. And we love you. And you don't have to say it back, but you're the man. Hey, I love you for all this information. I, this is I have no problems exchanging affection. Uh, so, <laughs> Gavin, I love you too. You do a fantastic job. I don't know how you do it, to be honest. Like, especially staying plugged into hockey, you know, while following the other sports. Um, and I know the Stars fans love it too, because I was on, uh, you know, another podcast, and they were, you know, promoting spits and suds, and I was just like that's the effect that's the gavin spittle effect. oh that's super cool that's super cool because i wondered if you guys get if we get promotion when you guys cheat on me but i'm <laughs> glad that... <laughs> no i'm super glad i think it's awesome like i'm the one pumping my fist when i see you on like you know big time podcasts or sean you know and uh, i mean sean's got like a scroll of things now that i mentioned when i intro him uh and by the way spits and suds listeners he's in vegas so we're going to try to track him down 
um, to have him on the podcast. Uh, so thank you, uh, David. Listen, this has been absolutely a great week. We've had four new podcasts. This is supposed to be the off season when things slow down, but we're not going to slow down. We're going to keep coming because the fact of the matter is, is you guys are still listening. So I saw a couple of you spread the word today and, you know, retweet some stuff, which is always appreciated. I saw a couple of you post new reviews, uh, whether it's on Apple or Spotify. And thank you so much for that. I mean, the reality is, is that the more you guys help as far as teammates, the more episodes that we can produce because we have shown that and we are probably a small part of it. But the coolest thing is, is hockey is alive and well in DFW. And it's so awesome to do this podcast and see the growth of this podcast, but also of David's Substack, of Sean's Substack, and um, you know, and everyone that we have on. It's huge thanks to Stephen Reserve. Love talking with him and getting AHL information. So it's just really, really cool. And you know, we're not just doing it for the stars. Um, you know, our goal is to promote women's hockey as well. Um, and anyone that comes out of DFW, heck, we had Cross Hannis on last week. He plays for the, uh, or recently plays for the Grand Rapid Griffiths, uh, started his career here in DFW. You know, it's all about promoting the great game. Okay. That's enough of that until next time. Enjoy the draft. Everyone, of course, you'll hear more of spits and suds soon. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah.